today that you're in great hands with Paul May, Nate Walton, and Tim Overdyer, that you'll, you'll feel art and ecology woven together thoroughly in, um, in terms of how we'll connect to the many systems that are uh, integrated here and, uh, and sort of the ways that these folks um, are tapped into them through stewardship and observation as well. More than once, I've been in front of a group of people more qualified than me and had to speak to them about something. So I'm okay with that. I'll just share with you what I do and we're gonna to cut to it pretty quick. And Nate, an entomologist, and Tim, a retired soil scientist, will help me because Daniel mentioned systems and you know we're all working in systems I may be speaking to the choir here. I don't think that anything is separated from anything else. Those of you who graze, anybody? You know that systems work together and it's important. Now I'm going to fetch one thing. I've got the fence off and we're going to move these cattle and start looking at some grass and bugs. One of my things that I like to do here, I'm always running experiments. I've decided that I'm running experiments all the time. This is Indian grass, I believe, that I have established in a perimeter. And I want Indian grass here. I want the warm season perennials. And my most effective tool that I've ever used out here is a completely empty bank account. So. I ain't got no tractor. I'm not getting a seed drill. I did that once and it, you know, put me in the hole too far. So I'm letting the landscape express and I'm using the cattle as all of the machinery. And they'll do the work for you if you let them. No, it's not just cattle. You got ants and worms and birds and all that. Uh, so I've got Indian grass here and I'm going to fetch oats. Yes, these are grass-fed cattle, and I'm going to fetch a little bit of oats. And they're salt. they got to have salt. I'm using Redmond salt with garlic. You can see that bag over here. The oats is candy and makes them want to consume it. The salt is a consumption retardant. I've gone without a bucket to relate to them a quite a lot. And if, God forbid, they get on the wrong side of a fence, you don't have them bucket trained, I find that to be inconvenient. If they're bucket trained, there's a, there's a chance that you'll get them out of the neighbor's yard. These seeds pass through cattle. Cattle and sheep are a pass-through system. Goats are not. So, when you start grazing, and you guys who are doing this, you know that. You're going to have interrupted maturity on a landscape. So you have a pollinator habitat the moment you start grazing. You're going to have some things left. You're going to have some things growing out of a pie. A pie dropped on something. So your bees always have something to do once you start grazing. And your clover, the first thing that's going to happen the first year, is your percentage of clover is going to increase. There are a couple of reasons for that. Most of it's because you're passing through a system. All right, grazers, come up like this far, 
and ease yourself. These wires are off. Come into where they were. Uh, when you have sheep, you're going to have four strands. I'm going to have four strands up. With cattle, typically two is one more wire than you need. A lot of guys run one. Even with cow-calf, because then the calf can sheet ahead. The cow will ground very well and is not going to touch the wire if you have sufficient voltage. So you can dictate what they're going to eat by how big you make these paddings. This is really great stuff and it's cheap. I've got up and running for a thousand bucks on the charger. You know, the, the fencer, the panel, sticks, and reel. Well, this was a desert 10 years ago, really. There was a lot of just brown soil showing through between plants. So you're just going to have to take it from me that this landscape has been improved primarily with cattle. But you can make a change on a landscape through hard work. You raise chickens out here, drag chicken tractors. They're empty right now. If that's what those are, I would move those twice a day, and they're 96 square feet, so I get, what, 192 square feet of, you know, pretty good coverage, chicken manure, each day, and I'd go from one end to the other, you know, from just out of the brooder to all dead by the other end, so you get an eight-foot-wide strip of chicken manure. People will tell you that chicken manure is too hot to apply directly. It is not. When you get rain... Um, it's dandy and these we can talk about cow pies later the most perfect invention ever they're just they're awesome uh, so Tim and Nate I would like to have share with you about just soils and bugs for a moment I'm gonna fill up some water cans and okay, this is, uh... Uh, a diagram that I created uh, as a grad student at MSU, and we kind of put together this um, this kind of graphical representation of the soil food web that we found in the apple orchards. Uh, and I'll pass this around a closer look at it. And the basic idea is that um, there's a lot of stuff down there uh, that you don't know about. A lot of those things are microscopic, uh, but plenty of them are not. Um, you Things like ants that are working deep down into the soil, um, coming up and down through those layers of the soil and bringing material from above, down below, and bringing material from below. And the arrows on that diagram are representing energy flow. So an arrow going from one type of organism to another means that that organism is eating the other one or getting some resource from the other one. And there's a lot of two-way arrows there. You know, the fungi are feeding the uh, insects. Insects are feeding the fungi, um, all kinds of back and forth going on there with the energy. And of course, the whole thing is driven by the sun and the plants putting uh, energy from the sun into the soil. Pasture like this, where there's minimal uh, management in terms of chemical use, uh, there's just plenty of opportunity for that biology to be doing all the all the great things that it can do. So. I do want to talk about one of my favorite organisms to talk about out here, and those are dung beetles. And we have dwellers. These are beetles that are going to be spending pretty much their entire life cycle inside of the cow pie. Okay, these guys are uh, laying eggs. They, they find it, they lay eggs in it. The larvae, immature stage larvae, live their entire life inside of cow pie. Uh, develop in their pupate and then emerge as an adult beetle. Most of what we'll probably see today are these dweller type dung beetles. Um, and you know these are all important uh, in, in breaking down the dung, the dung pad of the cow pie. We just have the rollers and these are the famous ones you've probably seen on the National Geographic <laughs> channel. Okay, uh, There aren't as many of these in Michigan. These are more common in southern climates. But they do exist here. Just, uh, and, but we do have tunnelers here. And tunnelers, by creating a tunnel, they're creating an airspace. Space for air, space for 
uh, oxygen and water to penetrate into the soil. So lots of good things happening there. Uh, it's, it's pretty much a uh, stabilized dune here. So there's a fine sand and <coughs> iron enriched down below indicating the acid. Can I look at it? Sure. Oh, yeah. It's kind oh, of yeah. an in nature, it's a moderately acid soil. That's good. I mean, do we know how much he started out with organic matter and where he's now? I, I suspect it was much less than 1%. Apparently, they had dairy cattle in here and they just ran the whole thing right. continuously. And like you said, there was a lot of bare soil showing. So he's he's really improved it already. I asked you guys, this is not weed, right? There's yeah. a lot of it. Yeah. yeah. My conventional farming friends that cut hay, they go to a new field. The first thing you do is spray down 2,4-D to kill yeah. themselves. Um, he's got a lot of it. Cow, cows don't eat it. Does anything eat they, it? They do eat it when they're confined like this. Okay. Yeah, they eat it. They yeah. eat it. So what, what does one do with this? Like he's got a lot of it, right? It's the tallest thing around. You just tolerate it? Is there... You get a bunch of goats. Like, what? It, you leave the cows longer. <laughs> like, the question you do uh, He's he's tolerating it, mm -hmm. and by increasing the density of the grasses, he's he's squeezing it out okay. eventually. So, yeah. if it's lush, if it's when the soil is good enough, the napweed will get out out competed by alfalfa and clover and yummy things. Or? I believe so, and it, again, it remains to be seen. <clears throat> One of the things savory is measuring out here is plant composition on the surface. So we'll see that over the next five years too. <coughs> we yeah, sort of interesting just observing here, and there are solid stretches where you don't see any seed heads from the napweed, and sort of interested to inquire in the fall of management of some of those. He might have some of the oral history of what's occurred so crowded out in those places. Up here. This compartmentalized stuff, good, bad. Come on, look at the person next to you. What did he do yesterday? You know, was he good and bad? Poor bad. So, napweed, bad nematodes, good nematodes. I got a book from the library about invasive plants of North America. There's a lot of them. Orchard grass, improved orchard grass, improved red clover. I don't think they're native. So, you know, I'm just not going to bother about whether they're good or bad. But, uh, but I'm trying to positively impact the landscape. I do have a major concern about where the carbon is. Tim touched upon carbon. I know that my soil organic matter level is higher here than it was 10 years ago, and that means that there's more carbon in the soil. That's active carbon, it's in cycle. When we get to char later, we'll talk about stabilizing carbon, which is really gonna benefit you and other people. So, you know, these off species. Look around you, you can see that the, uh, the orchard grass, that doesn't have a cow pie under it, is probably chewed right to the surface. And this napweed that's just coming into bloom is highly nutritious. And I used to get them to eat. But I think maybe the bugs that are here on them now might be degrading their palatability. You know, cattle will eat what's presented to them uh, going from ice cream to broccoli. Ice cream first, just like the kids in their first year at college. Mm -hmm. So this uh, little bit of purple love grass here, it's not quite as high on the palatability curve as the napweed. If sheep were here, this clover would be gone. One of the values of multi-species ruminant grazing is better utilization of a landscape, better utilization of forage. Cattle eat grass first. Sheep eat legumes first, particularly clover. Uh, and oh, that's some devilish sort of grass right there with that little seed head on this it. This one? Yep. 
and you know, if I'm lucky, I get more of it next year. I'm pretty indiscriminate about what plants are growing here, although I don't like horse hair. It's got that thorn on it, and I saw some out there a little while ago. I don't know what it does. I got something out here called Dame's Rocket, which they ain't gonna eat. Okay. If you can choke your paddock down tight enough, they're gonna stomp it into the ground and it's gonna decompose. And the bugs in the soil have something to eat, so cool. So it's a bad plant, it's not a good plant, it's a bad plant, big deal. I'm not gonna come out here and pull it all out. Uh, let's ease our way over to the edge there and we'll look at some cow pies and something else yeah okay. yeah yeah this is my message to you drilling is killing quit tilling don't apply synthetics you know, if you don't want to listen to me on those two things, good for you. I'm not doing them. So this is probably from a young guy. These these have this a little bit starchier. This one shows a little hint of starchiness. You know, that indicates less quality of forage. So when they're starchy like that, they don't break down as fast. Or... That's right. They persist here. All of these things, I think work together you know you make a snowball at the top of a hill and you push it over and it just keeps getting bigger so when you let these things exist the first bug will show up and do what he needs to do with it and then next year you know this is a patient sort of a thing with me the next year maybe two bugs will show up and before you know it and i didn't have quite so much dung beetle pressure this year. Dung beetles are the rock stars, right? I come out here and I see beetles. You know, and if I dig around, I'll find worms. I'm distracted by that. So as Nate and Tim will tell you, this soil is now occupied by more kinds of living organism than we have yet named. Because I ain't killing it and I'm not putting anything on it. Except the most perfect invention that's ever been come up with. When you eat salad or cauliflower or whatever, you're gonna return like 90 plus percent of it. They're gonna take this biomass and they're gonna return like 80%. They're more efficient than me and you. That's the most efficient system that has yet come to be. I don't care if it's creation or evolution. I don't even care. That's the most efficient unit on planet Earth to convert biomass into something else. And still, they're turning out 80%, give or take, to the soil. We've had MSU and Cornell for less than 200 years. This system has been at work for a long time. And I think it's a pretty good system. That's a home. It's a workplace. It's a food source for all of the characters that I want here. I was talking to Nate about ants. I got interested in ants because I got ants out here. There's more ants underneath the ground, you know, probably on an acre than our total weight. You know, good, bad, whatever. You're doing something. Now, I'm not opposed to throwing on annual seeds. I'll come out here, you know, in some summers, before it got any good at all, I had to add in square bale, like each day. A round bale had been here, and it ended up being a bare spot. So, two days ago, this was nothing but turnips. Right, yeah, eight, ten inches high. Don't have much of a bulb under anything. It's kind of compacted soil. But, you know, 
take him right here and shave this stuff down pretty good. Annuals like this, if you can get open pollinated seed, you can establish them in a pasture and perennialize them just by putting on more than they can eat. And, you know, the concept of strip grazing, you know, they're off of this. And depending on how much landscape you've got and all that, and how much you're going to, like, add in a bale if you need to, to get through the day, uh, the savory concept, that's right, Daniel wanted me to stick with savory a little bit. And, you know, that's my motivation for doing this, is the Allen Savory Intense animal impact and then recovery. This is how we get carbon in the soil. And carbon isn't N, P, or K, but you're not going to get those to persist without carbon to work with. You know, carbon is, uh, carbon is promiscuous, the scientists say. Carbon will go on a date with anyone. So, in the dormant season, you can put cattle anywhere and, and leave them. They can't kill what's going on below the surface in the dormant season. Put them someplace lousy and drop bale. The best spots out here are dead bale. You know, wherever it looks decent and green, because this too was a desert 10 years ago when I came here. Once you buy hay, you've got it forever. <laughs> Move them every day. When you leave them parked, you got to restart the rumen a little bit. I, th I think you'll lose rumen activity. And, you know, I used to run sheep out here. And this is a motley looking crew. I mean, real. <laughs> That's some pretty skanky cows. They really are. I look in Stockman Grass Farmer and I see the ads for cattle. And these are advertised. I'll tell you what. I got lucky and found some small cattle. And I can work with them out here. I can't work with cattle that big. Somebody will call SPCA on me. So, move them every day. If you want the landscape to improve and, you know, to take care of them, I think you have to during the growing season. I think it's vitally important culling a little bit. So if I were to get sheep again, I'd have to find something that takes really low maintenance. And I'm wise cracking with an old timer. You know, I asked him about sheep and he was experienced. He says, sheep wake up in the morning and look at each other and try to figure out a new way to die. <laughs> and the, the times that I've had like drought conditions in the summer and it went dormant several years ago when it was really horrible. The southwest corner offers some shade in the middle of summer, so I would confine my animals up there and bring in bales. And I parked them for 10 days in the southwest corner, and I had sheep at the time. And then, you know, we got some rain and started turning green out a little bit, but that first growth of grass, it's high-powered grass. The first couple inches of vegetative grass, and sure enough, and I kind of knew it was going to happen. I moved the bunch onto some fresh grass. I had two dead sheep the next day from bloat. Jim Garish, who is a big proponent of, you know, quit using hay. Make them work in the wintertime. At Lake City, he said to us, he sat down and he said, I'm sorry to tell you guys, you're in the one place in the lower 48 where you got to feed hay. <laughs> so northwest lower Michigan. They come out in the morning, and their behavior when you move them, you got to watch them when you move them. And they'll tell you, was your paddock big enough? Was it not big enough? The climate is changing, obviously. Grass and trees can't evolve to changing conditions as fast as you and I can. 
So we can want the orchard grass and brome to grow later in the year. Can't do it. So, you know, if you're going to run a no-till seed drill, don't till. Get the Aitchison seed drill. God, they look good. Put in something like uh, brassica. Because it, it, we'll see some more as we go. Great palatability. The nutritive value is, is terrific. And another, you know, pot growing, pot smoking friend of mine with goats running around this place has perennialized purple top turnip in his landscape just by outnumbering the mouths with it. And, you know, that's my gig here. Uh, a friend of mine who can remain nameless took pity on me early this year. I was telling him, that, you know, I'll go along the ditch and cut this, this chicory. Are you seeing that? Oh my God, is this stuff good? Read about the nutritive analysis on it. Cool. And does it ever thrive on its own? You know, it multiplies on the margin of the road, even without grazing. So I've been clipping it and throwing it out here, and I'm getting it to establish. So this friend got me some of it, and I threw it on. And we're going to see a lot of blue out here next year. These weeds, these off-species things, you know, every book that tells you, you know, what they're telling you. I've got a calcium deficient soil. These things go down and get calcium. If you can get them once in a while, squeeze down your paddock, make them eat it. You've just put it in cycle. You know, it's just another plant. It's doing its job. I'm not going to get upset with it. I'd rather see something else there. Whatever. Uneven maturity in the landscape. So it's always, you know, the bees always have something to do. You know, I'm going to have just a little tiny bit more clover next year. I hope. Right. Rotation. Savory talks about recovery. And Jason Roundtree at Lake City, if you're going to graze and you can access the people at Lake City, do so because they're doing the Lord's work down there. Uh, the very end of August we were in there, I got into that end of this strip. First of August something like that and you know we took off decent feed I've been around the perimeters four times this year my rotations are slowing down there's getting to be more recovery time so we'll see We'll see more flowers as we go now. Eat here. Here's a bad one. Oh, in the textbooks it'll say toxic. This is toxic. What is it called? That's leafy spurge. That's oxtail? No, that's leafy spurge. Oh, leafy Yeah. I thought, you know, and then a cat would look at them. Can I eat that? And they, they can't eat much. But some of these things, you can buy plantain seed. Nobody's gonna sell you spurge seed. This is just here, it's indicative of deficiencies in the soil. It's reasonable feed. <laughs> and it'll keep them alive. So that's very thin there. You know, it tilts. Water doesn't hold there that good. When I've run chickens through this strip, I'm kind of lazy. I'm always in a hurry. I'll be closest to the water. I got water running this way. I'll go this way. This looks just as bad as that. 
five years ago. And you don't see chicken tractors going down it right now. But they did. Question. Yeah. How do you decide how big the paddocks are? How do you decide, decide how big the paddocks are? If they're standing right at the gate when I get there, <laughs> leaning over it. Maybe I didn't give them enough the day before. So if they're slow to move, maybe you've given them too much. When first I came out here, you know, I paid the price for having a lousy feed. You know, a couple of times I've had animals in the wrong spot. It's a bummer. So, you know, thus, I have felt free over the years to take whatever gross I had in my pocket and put it right back into the soil in the form of bales. And ruminants prefer, this is my experience, something that's attached to the ground and is living. They'll eat that, well, if you got some really high-powered alfalfa hay, they might go over and suck all that up. But for the most part, you know, they'll eat off-brand living plants before hay that's got a string tied around it. They'll eat hay before spurge. Let me ask you a question about that. We hear a lot about methane as being a much worse greenhouse grass. Go ahead. You know, the, you know my question. <laughs> if you quit killing it, there's methanotropic bacteria present in the soil. So, uh, below the surface, there's all sorts of exchanges going on. Methane is being created below the surface and it will release. Thank God that you didn't put anything on your landscape that can convert that on the way out to multiply. So cattle and methane, that's a feedlot thing. And let's not, let's not even think about comparing feedlot cattle to what you're going to do grazing cattle or chicken in tractors to a Tyson or right. whoever contract right. birdhouse with 188,000 or whatever they put in there. But at any rate, the relationship between the animals on top and the, uh, the chemistry that's going on below, I think here on pasture we win the argument. And that's great. You know, we have scientific data and we, we record it, we make the argument. Well, unless you've got enough money to get the messaging out there, your argument doesn't matter to anybody but you. I think we'll, we can be okay in our home networks, our little communities and whatnot, and you know, even get out into the marketplace a little bit. Responsible stewardship, changing landscapes, people who drive by here, I have, you know, I used to work in the building trades. I have redneck hammer swinging friends who go out of their way on the way to a job to drive past this. And, you know, I haven't burdened them on the job site with the philosophy behind why I'm doing what I'm doing. They just like it. You know, I think, cool. Hey, that looks better than it used to. All right. That's how I'm going to get the message across to them, you know, it appeals to us visually. We're regreening the landscape, which is where savory comes from. Uh, there's a lot of literature about the archaeology and all that of, you know, why the Sahara changes size over the eons. You can shrink the Sahara yourself at home with them. <laughs> One of these days we're going to get carbon credits. One of these days the government is going to pay us to do this. And again, something visual that distracts us from what's really going on. Here's cow poop, right? The real accumulator is the urine. That's what's delivering it. So give them salt, they need it. It'll make them drink, and when they drink, they're gonna distribute nutrients. 
The same with you. If you got to pee, just do it. <laughs> you know, we, we get the seasonal expression of this particular fungus, and other times of the year I see other ones. Uh, open landscapes tend to be bacterial dominated, forests tem tend to be fungal, and, you know, ideal is a mix. So this allows me to feel a little bit happier about what's going on out here. A friend told me the other day that puffball indicates probably a compacted soil. Well, that's, it's a sand dune. It's had a little bit of traffic on it, and it hasn't been grazed enough. Again, rodents after Japanese beetle grubs, knapweed going way down, and then cattle on it are going to help with the compaction. If I had a key line plow or something such as that, well, I could get that done faster, but it would cost me more money than I've got to do it. And, you know, it goes against my general philosophical push. Crows, starlings, <laughs> whoever will come in and they'll eat a lot of grasshoppers. But the crows in the springtime, not every year. But some years I've seen a cloud out here and just go from one end to the other, just going through cow pies. So I asked a friend of mine who, he smokes pot. I said, what are they, what are they eating? He said, they're eating cow poop. Because they're, you know, the raccoons and the birds, they're not going to the store. They're just finding something. And at times of the year, cow poop's the best damn thing going. So they'll eat it. It's vegetation, run through a grinder, and you know, put silage starter put on, sauerkraut starter. It's grass. Or whatever. Just add a little something added to it. Some thistles will hold on to their tight seed head until late in the winter. This one's already opening up and I've lost a couple of seeds. But I clipped a bunch of this a couple of weeks ago. But my idea is to let the bees get off it. Because last summer when I came out here, I'd see a thistle and I'd get violent. And I'd get my shovel and I'd take that sucker right down to the earth. Well, pretty predictable result, right? Now you got 10 times as many seed flower heads and they're real close to the ground. So now you've really got a lot of seeds. So I thought, I'm gonna let them go until the bees are done with them and I can get at the seed head. So I'll have to do it again next year. Why do you hate it? I've never seen them eat it. I just, I can't get them to eat it. Do you have autumn olive in these fields and stuff? Yeah, yeah. Yonder you see a rock and a little bit of growth behind it. And when I started here, there were several autumn olives 10 to 15 feet high. And even with a smaller number of animals, believe it or not, oh, they love that spot. They still like going to the rock. It's their favorite spot out here. And they rub up on those autumn olives and eat them. And, you know, if you've ever kept goats amongst uh, vertical, you know, saplings and whatnot, you ain't going to have vertical saplings <laughs> for too long unless you really outnumber the goats with the saplings. Because these animals will get right on top of it and bend it over and break it. So I really wanted the autumn olive to persist, but it ain't gonna, you know. I, and why did you want it? Just for them? Yeah. For shade? Or? And it's high quality forage. When I go past properties, you know, and people get all oh my God, we got to do something about that autumn olive. What? I think of is, I think, the answer to most problems, fence and water. This outfit used to be called Island, art, where art and ecology meet, and you grazers, um, there's some science behind it, there's some technical stuff behind it, but it's an art. So, you know, the size of your paddock, I'm probably giving myself too much credit here. That's, that's up to you. This grass looks nice from here. Mm -hmm. It's too short. 
but it's what I got and it's better than it was. And we're moving forward because this method puts more carbon into the soil, even in the active cycle. Yeah, you're walking on my grass. Are you down that way at all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>